Next we have uh, uh, Ramon Weber, who joins us from the MIT Media Lab uh, from Boston, where he's a PhD candidate working with Neri Oxman. But um, today he will be mainly presenting uh, his own work, which is actually much better than Neri Oxman's work. So that is, that is a good decision. And uh, maybe for the decorum, so um, after we'll have Ramon presenting and then Molly, and then afterwards we'll have a, a discussion with uh, the three speakers. We'll try to construct our spectrum. So that's a round table just before lunch. <laughs> Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks very much uh, for the invitation. I'm really excited and uh, glad to be here. I can manage my PowerPoint. What happened? What? What happened? So Um, so, like we heard from the first, uh, like from uh, Gilles, I also had like a very traditional kind of architecture education where like digital design didn't really exist beyond a niche. But I was always kind of fascinated when kind of advances in building technologies and structures were tightly knit and kind of resulted in new ways of architectural ex expression. Here is an example. Um, the Gatti Wool Factory by Pierluigi Nervi uh, that uses kind of column structures uh, with uh, structurally optimized kind of floor slabs to reduce the amount of concrete needed. Uh, and of course, Fry Otto's experiments with form and forces here as an example, the structural model of the Mannheim multi -hulle. And my research tries to explore how new digital tools and workflows can help us answer those kind of uh, challenges of lightness and um, novel ways of building. And looking at the work yesterday in the gallery also, I believe it's fair to say that we are again at like a moment where technological advances paired with design experimentations are leading to a new generation of architectural expression. And so I wanna start kind of with digital formation and uh, also like my first kind of encounters with the digital, that was like when can, I was working for Philip Block at ETH Zurich and we, um, created these uh, cable net fabric formwork concrete shells 
that were like kind of a novel take on, on shell structures where we use completely reusable um, fabric and kind of uh, uh, tension ties uh, to create formworks for uh, concrete shells that are extremely thin. And uh, we kind of developed these parametric layouts for the cables and uh, computational form finding processes that dictated an optimal shell geometry to create kind of a finger thick uh, shell. And it was like a first prototype that since then kind of scaled up and the team in Zurich is constructing now fabric former shells with five and kind of 10, 20 meter spans. And I was always interested in the notion of the digital kind of equilibrium. And when I was working at Zaha Hadid Architects, we created this uh, helical uh, sculpture uh, and like a seemingly impossible form that seems to only act in bending. But we took inspiration from uh, Renaissance like staircases out of stones that kind of have structural engineers startled until today. Like where a stack of stones is uh, connected only through interlocking. And so uh, basically each step is uh, set on the other step so that it transfers uh, forces in through its rotation and kind of creates this, uh, makes it possible to use very thin uh, stone slabs, which would crack otherwise if they were kind of introduced in uh, bending. And this we then adapted digitally and kind of created these parametric uh, workflows and kind of different options of how we could uh, scale, this, scale this up. And so we created a structure only from like concrete blocks. that are uh, held together by a single tension cord. And this interest in combination of different uh, structural systems kind of continued um, when I was uh, um, in uh, Stuttgart in Germany and where we kind of created uh, systems from tensile uh, membranes and bending active systems. So traditionally, an engineer will dimension anything uh, so that it doesn't bend. But uh, when like materials, are, like new materials such as like glass fiber, they don't break when they bend, but actually uh, they can be under dimensioned that, uh, so that they are allowed to bend. And with this, we can construct much lighter uh, structures. So we uh, created this proposal for a, a pavilion, which won like the Fry Otto Award in uh, Stuttgart. Which, um, so which would be a combination of a cable net and a tensile structure where um, a roof is kind of levitating above the ground and a different uh, members uh, are combined where like we have like a grid shell as like a facade that acts in bending and in compression and then it's combined with a tensile uh, membrane and cable net that pulls everything down to the ground. And so this then also like we kind of validated in like a little uh, model uh, studies. So here's some impressions of the structure. And so this is all like an interplay between forces and kind of the facade under compression and the bending and the roof under tension as like a fabric and a cable net. And was also what was very interesting is that we kind of tried out with engineers kind of different types of cable nets and to see uh, how they would distribute the forces. And we ended up with this cauliflower-like uh, shape that uh, actually kind of worked surprisingly well under kind of different uh, load uh, situations. Mm -hmm but also has like a very kind of expressive uh, uh, structure. And so here you see a bit how like this would then uh, be constructed. And next I would like to uh, touch on like ultra uh, lightweight materials. So carbon fiber typically used in like the automotive and aerospace industry. And recently there has been a lot of like research to see its uh, potential also scaling it up in, in architecture. And so fibers are made from like different textile layers that are kind of placed on top of each other and then um, uh, laminated in place with kind of a resin which acts as the glue. And so uh, different um, uh, layers are stacked on top of each other. Um, they're kind of, uh, and through that uh, layering, we can kind of create uh, different uh, thicknesses also inside of one material. And instead of trying to create stiff forms, we again uh, try to go as thin as possible and use the inherent material properties that allow the structure to bend. 
and combining this with integrated actuation and sensing to create kind of robotic architecture that could also react to the environment and user feedback. So also this kind of layering then allows to then also add like, uh, bending and strain sensors on top of the material that could then uh, respond uh, to the environment. And so here are some examples of how like different uh, uh, layering could then create kind of uh, structured folds that when kind of uh, uh, the structure would be kind of uh, pushed together, it kind of pops up in uh, kind of new ways. And that's kind of achieved then through like the combination of different fibers that are um, laid on top of each other in different directions. And then the folds again create kind of a, a, a structural shell. Yeah, so here's like some examples of this. And the idea is to kind of create super lightweight structures that allow, uh, like that can also move and that can kind of adapt and to, to their, their environments. Yeah, and also kind of trying to kind of uh, combine uh, different structural systems, so like having like plates that are uh, folded and through like the fold stiff and combining them with membranes that are more tensile and like kind of holding everything uh, together. So now we're still uh, talking about uh, kind of uh, fibers like that are uh, textile structures, but then again, like usually, like if it's not a, a Formula One race car or like an, a, a rocket car part, we don't actually need that much um, uh, stiffness or strength. So in uh, Stuttgart, in Germany, um, uh, working with the startup Fiber and like uh, and the ICD uh, research group, like we uh, kind of develop kind of systems of how. Um, actually not that many fibers can be used. So like maybe if we scale it up to like a building scale, um, we don't have to use carbon fiber for everything, but maybe we can use glass fiber and carbon fiber in combinations and have only material where it's needed. So I was uh, involved in like the, the founding, of, uh, like in uh, the startup fiber that is now kind of uh, like coming out of the ICD in Stuttgart to make robotic fiber manufacturing commercially available in the building industry. Um, it was founded by uh, Moritz Sostenmann, who you see on the picture handling the, the robot. Um, and so there, like, uh, we created kind of these, like, workflows of uh, new ways of kind of combining these structures. So this means that we can kind of build much more lightweight and we can only have material where it's needed. So this is an example uh, from, like, James Solly and Fiber in a collaboration where they made this kind of structurally lightweight beam that was optimized uh, so that uh, kind of started out as, like, a full kind of beam structure and then gradually kind of the engineers kind of took away all the fibers which were needed. And the fibers kind of act uh, when they kind of touch each other as, like, an interlocking uh, net and through that kind of create uh, stiff uh, structures. And so through these manufacturing processes with fibers, we can create kind of new types of mass customization. So like in, in the process of creating these uh, fiber structures, the robot weaves things on frames. And these frames, they're not like, uh, they can also change positions and the material itself uh, doesn't need to kind of um, be customized to a certain shape, but this would allow them for kind of new types of products also to be created with these uh, new manufacturing technologies, and here's some like, uh, uh, design studies that uh, we did. And then we also had like a little uh, collaboration uh, with uh, Zaha Hadid Architects, where we kind of developed this uh, prototype for like a modular uh, chair that could have like an adjustable frame, and then kind of depending on, on how you would uh, want the, the chair to look, it could kind of have uh, different, um, different versions, but using the same manufacturing principles. So these are like some uh, early model studies from this uh, collaboration, where the idea was to have like a structural shell on the bottom from carbon fiber and then glass uh, uh, or fiber or like colored uh, string and membranes on the top. And kind of creating this interplay between different um, uh, structural systems again. And here also with different versions of, like on the left you see one with uh, carbon fiber on the bottom and then in the middle uh, with a membrane on top and on the right with glass fiber and uh, colored string to create kind of a unique uh, seating experience. And so 
the next or like kind of the biggest thing I wanted to talk about is uh, digital assembly. So um, this year, uh, together with Samuel Leder, my uh, collaborator, we completed this project called Robotic uh, Timber, which um, kind of also um, which does research in uh, new ways of uh, robotic um, construction. So, like current construction methods are all kind of based on the human builder, and here we see uh, Winston Churchill uh, stacking brick. Apparently, he was a very gifted bricklayer. Um, and then, uh, even though like we have like nowadays robots to start to infiltrate construction sites and uh, a lot of like research that is being done in this area, they are largely made to imitate humans' con construction methods. So here on the left, you see uh, Komatsu Kohler's research project where they do on-site uh, robotic construction, and on the right, uh, Silver's uh, peripatetic fabrication, which is like a, a small-scale robot that is designed to kind of walk bricks to the bricklayer so he doesn't get tired. But they still kind of are in this notion of like kind of imitating the way that we humans build and trying to use robots like for to to help us do that. And so uh, we kind of wanted to like work with uh, timber, and timber is like a very interesting case because the timber industry is actually at like the forefront of implementing these automated tools and kind of digital workflows. And but it all kind of remains as like a prefabricated, pre-planned components that are kind of made in these very highly controlled factory environments. So here on the left, we see like some experimental research by the ICP again, where they uh, customly milled um, uh, panels with kind of almost zero tolerance uh, to, to fit uh, with finger joints into each other for an exhibition hall in Germany. And then uh, in the middle, uh, it's uh, kind of a picture from Gramazzi Fuller's uh, research, the sequential roof. So this was kind of done in collaboration with uh, uh, a wood manufacturer that had like this giant CNC machine that would then automatically stack uh, these uh, wood pieces that were then later shipped on site. And on the right, uh, EPFLs, also timber folded plate structures that were also prefabricated, pre milled, and then assembled in uh, kind of a, a lab. And so, kind of construction sites are always still dependent on human workers, even if uh, they're made with highly like, prefabricated parts. And robots have like a very uh, big difficulty to also navigate these unstructured environments. So on the left, like the, the milling that we saw before, but now like fully assembled and uh, assembled by human workers. In the middle, uh, Shigeru Ban Architects, the media office, uh, which is like the, the office for a big newspaper in Zurich that used like highly uh, custom like milled timber joints. But they again kind of were prefabricated they came on site and then they're yeah, assembled uh, by humans in a very like laborious process. And then new research um, from ETH Zurich, uh, also on the right, like uses uh, a robot that they put on kind of tank uh, uh, threads and like that navigates around a, a construction site to make rebar for, for concrete walls. Uh, but this is kind of trying to fuse a robot or like put a robot uh, onto uh, like a construction site, which proves to be very, very difficult. So can we actually like use these tools that were conceived and optimized for like the Fordist assembly lines uh, in an architectural scale? Like it's, it seems to me that it's very difficult to use something that was kind of in the past uh, 40, 50 years kind of made to sit next to uh, the auto, the, the street where the, the cars get assembled and just uh, drill in at the same hole like all day long for, for its whole, uh, Lifetime. Can we actually use this and put it on, on a construction site? And so as like briefly mentioned by Gilles as well earlier, kind of there is kind of new applied robotics research that suggests how like robots can start to assemble uh, structures larger than themselves and like assemble structures in kind of uh, these new environments. So uh, on uh, the left, you see uh, a project at the MIT Media Lab by uh, Ben Janet who uh, creates these small robots that assemble uh, these lattice structures. So the la lattices are like uh, prefabricated carbon fiber uh, uh, kind of cubes that can be stacked by the robots and the robots can kind of together kind of assemble these large scale structures. Um, and on the uh, right, you see um, uh, some ro further robotics research from the uh, MIT where kind of modular robots are uh, joining hands to climb in an unstructured uh, strut environments. 
And so uh, we wanted to kind of go in a different direction and kind of use like a very uh, standard building material. So we like wanted to work with wood, which is kind of can we can use as like a highly standardized, very abundant, super sustainable material that can also be sourced locally. Instead of kind of trying to do like a, a prefabricated uh, uh, 3D printed parts that are assembled by robots usually. And so how can we kind of synthesize the complexity and kinematic freedoms of a robotic manipulator into kind of a minimal modular system? So uh, on the left, the standard robotic manipulator that is used in factories worldwide. And then we try to see how can we create something that could uh, also have this kinematic freedom, but is maybe can be recombined differently. So we broke down the system into a series of like modular nodes that can collaborate together and achieve tasks, for example, like passing along a strut, as you see here. So instead of kind of trying to build a whole robot, we kind of only build joints and then use the building material, which in our case is the wooden strut, to kind of uh, move the joints and also move itself as the building material to where it needs to be placed. And so this way we can create a system that links like kinematic freedom one-to-one -one with the built output. So here you see like uh, structures that are kind of being assembled and disassembled. And the, the interesting thing is that the way that the nodes are connected, they can actually only uh, assemble a very specific types of structure. So like here you see nodes with uh, four degrees of freedom that are kind of connected together into like um, kinematic chains. So like one of these arms would be a kinematic chain. And then uh, it kind of actually can only like place these three struts because of the configuration of how the, the nodes are put together. Uh, and otherwise it's kind of helpless, but it can kind of place the, the struts in this, in this way. And so how can we then try to build that uh, for real? So we kind of created a robotic node that combines like off the shelf parts and custom ABS 3D printed parts. It has like an onboard battery and like a Raspberry Pi and uh, was like one and a half kilos and cost like 160 uh, euros. So this is the assembled robotic node that we used for our like first experiments. Uh, you see how it like grips onto a strut. It can rotate in the middle with one axis and it has like all uh, electronics uh, on board. And so the robot can rotate with like uh, a high uh, uh, kind of gear ratio to, to be able to kind of uh, have enough torque. And then kind of gripping very, very slow. So we use like metal uh, worm gears that kind of uh, uh, make sure that kind of unless the motors are powering the, the, the gears, they can't move. Uh, so that way we can kind of have a robot that actually is locked when it's not powered which is very important for the battery life. And then also they're supposed to like, communicate and kind of, there are sounds, <laughs> and uh, kind of collaborate together. So here's like kind of this basic version of our uh, uh, first experiments with like a fixed feeding zone where we would place struts and kind of the nodes can then pass along struts to the out on the outside. So you see how um, like the nodes are kind of placed on one plane above the, the wooden uh, kind of struts and then through that, they kind of work on their work plane. They have the wooden struts below them, and then they pass along new building material uh, through the outside. And so we created kind of a series of robotic behaviors that could then be recombined to create uh, like any type of structure. Um, so like we kind of created uh, a locomotion strategy. So how can we actually move uh, these kinematic chains on an already built structure? How can we kind of feed new material, moving material from a fixed point to, uh, to nodes uh, on the structure? How can we pass material, moving material from one kinematic chain to another? And then lots of how can we place material uh, in like a specified location? And then how can we actually change the level? So how can then robots move to uh, another uh, build plane? So here you see like the locomotion, how two robots grip together uh, one on one strut, and then they can start to move along anywhere on a 2D surface. And so we kind of tested this out in, in, in real, on like a, kind of a little test plane in, in 2D. Yeah, and so like a series of like gripping and ungripping, 
uh, makes the robot able to like walk along uh, a series of fixed struts from uh, left to right. And here you see how robots kind of the same behavior like uh, for passing along struts from uh, one end to another. And here, like finally, the physical behavior like I showed uh, interestingly before, how like one kinematic chain picks up a strut and then kind of moves it to uh, another feeding point, or, or like from the feeding point to, to the right side. And so with these behaviors, we kind of, uh, with the very simple behaviors, we can place struts in almost any orientation on a 2D surface, as you can see on the image, which is our kind of basic 2D topology. And so um, where we go from there is like we, we had to kind of conceive like methods of like uh, creating uh, also out of plane movement. And so the way that works is like by not only having two uh, kinematic that, or two nodes collaborate, but more nodes that kind of can create uh, kinematic chains with more, with like a higher level of complexity. Like we can actually kind of combine them and add them in different build planes to kind of move up and down uh, a structure and then change the levels uh, and kind of pass on material to a next level. And so um, then like after kind of stacking this, we kind of uh, created a side effector, or we call it, that we can mount to the side of our robot that kind of join uh, and to, to fix struts. So we use like a, an automatic screw feeder that you can buy off Amazon and kind of incorporated it with like a motor and like a linear axis to kind of be able to screw in uh, uh, screws. And since it's connected to the top side of the robot, it can then also spin and uh, of course then uh, fix uh, struts in different locations. So here you see it on like the real thing in action. It's extremely slow. Uh, yeah. And so after like stacking this, we can move up and kind of create this two and a half D topologies, right? um, which kind of goes beyond like a single plane. And so this results in kind of a, a large design space where the system kind of, uh, of the machine is kind of very tightly linked together. And so we create this kind of new like uh, design library of like how can we actually kind of, or what kind of structures can we create can we, with like mi minimum distance with maximum distance uh, of how the nodes are spaced apart. And then we can also kind of rotate the struts and kind of um, uh, have, create like uh, connections in between to create like stable and stiff uh, structures. And also create then moment connections that would allow two struts to kind of connect together. And then we can also kind of create denser areas for reinforcement where then also the robotic nodes can, can pass along uh, more material. And this kind of uh, features like new design opportunities in timber-based architecture. And we can uh, also kind of address new like issues of density and continuity and structures can gradually adapt from a solid stack to a light frame in a single construction, construction element. And so here you can see how we can design for both the macro scale and the micro scale in the structure, like similar to like additive manufacturing, because the resolution of more or less the same design like matters, and it can be solved in completely different ways to achieve like different visual, structural, and architectural performance. And so the construction systems enables the con uh, creation of continuous beam-like elements and in like a single uh, construction system. And here you see like a, a quick time lapse of how then uh, uh, an architectural prototype would be constructed out of this. Um, and kind of to like sum up a bit, we would like to shift from like a prefabricated, pre-planned structures to like easily transportable in situ construction systems to create like uh, building systems that don't have to rely on machines that are larger than the built artifacts themselves, but like more robust, decentralized robotic systems where simple robots can start to work in parallel. And so the, the research showcases how kind of these new tectonic topologies and design tools can like emerge from these new uh, fabrication systems. And new construction machines can also and should also not be uh, only develop to speed up existing processes, but can be much more effective when they create their own structural logics and also then aesthetic expressions. And so merging the current industry standards of fully, fully solid CLT and open balloon frames into structures that are kind of fully continuous, but yet like vary in density. 
And so we can create buildings where like whole building components that have like uh, from discrete parts that go into solid plates to openings and have reinforcements at different uh, places of the way. And we like, can imagine like a construction future, uh, a future construction site where it can all like work in full autonomy and like you can have tight progress tracking that can allow for like the evasion of any unknowns or human error. Like material supply can be timed perfectly to like do just in like a factory at just in time or just in sequence production of a building. And on the image, we see how new struts and robotic nodes arrive to the construction site and then get like, fed into the system. Kinematic chains then connect and break up the building material to pass it through the system. And of course, we can then also like, produce energy locally. And so we imagine like, architectural structures that can be kind of quick, quickly built in parallel by multiple robotic teams. In, like to create long spans and that, but that are still reversible and through that adaptive to change. Yes, thank you.